Oh, yes. No, no, no. You know what time it is? Okay, that's that's enough. That's enough. Enough of the theme tonight. We don't have that much time. And it's only 45 minutes or so, and it's Christmas Eve. And uh, for the last uh, six or seven years now, we have read this story, and I've gotten a lot of uh, requests for it. And it's uh, kind of a thing we always do on Christmas Eve. And it's a, it's a short story that uh, originally appeared in Playboy. It's not really a short story. It was a chapter from my novel, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. And uh, the short story, it was not really a short story. As I said, the chapter was uh, appeared in Playboy, and that year won the Humor Award for that year for that particular story. However, this story uh, begins, and uh, the title of the story uh, for those of you who have your tape recorder on, and it will be shortened and edited for use on the air, obviously, because it's a much longer story than I can do on the air, but it's very apropos for Christmas Eve. The story is called Duel in the Snow, or Red Rider Nails the Cleveland Street Kid. <laughs> Now, the opening of the story, the I in the story is not me, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a universal I, and this particular I is named Ralph Parker, who is a New Yorker. And he's sitting in the Horn and Hard Art, having a cup of coffee. And he begins to, uh, to think about the, the curious lure that toy guns have for kids. Kids all over the world are attracted to toy guns, whether or not their parents want them to do it or not. It's just a universal urge. Outside in the spanking December breeze, a Salvation Army Santa Claus listlessly tolled his bell, huddled in a doorway to avoid the direct blast of the wind. I sipped my coffee and remembered another Christmas, in another time, in another place, and a gun. I remember clearly, itchingly, nervously, maddeningly the first time I laid eyes on it, pictured in a three-color smeared illustration in a full-page back cover ad in Open Road for Boys, a publication which at the time had an iron grip on my aesthetic sensibilities and the dime that I had to scratch up every month to stay with it. It was actually an early playboy. It sold dreams, fantasies, incredible adventures, and a way of life. Its center foldouts consisted of gigantic Kodiak bears charging out of the page at the reader to be gunned down in single hand-to-hand -hand combat by the 11-year-old killers armed only with hunting knife and fantastic bravery. Its Christmas issue weighed over seven pounds, its page crammed with the effluvia of the good life of male juvenilia, until the senses reeled, and avariciousness, the growing desire to own everything, was almost unbearable. Today there must be millions of ex-subscribers who still can't pass Abercrombie and Fitch without a faint, keening note of desire and the unrequited urge to glom onto all of it, just to have it, to feel it. Early in the fall, the first ad appeared. It was a magnificent thing of balanced copy and pictures, superb artwork, and subtly contrived catchphrases. I was among the very first hooked. I freely admit it. Boys, Boys, at last you can own an official Red Rider carbine action 200-shot range model air rifle. This in block red and black letters surrounded by a large balloon coming out of Red Rider's own mouth wearing his enormous ten-gallon Stetson, his jaw squared, staring out at me manfully and speaking directly to me, eye to eye. In his hand was the knurled stock of as beautiful, as coolly deadly-looking piece of weaponry as I'd ever laid eyes on. Yes, yes fellows, fellows, Red Rider continued, under the gun. Yes, fellows, this 200-shot carbine action air rifle, just like the one I use in all my range wars, chasing them rustlers and bad guys, can be your own, your very own. It has a special built-in secret compass in the stock for telling the direction if you're lost on the trail, and also an official Red Rider sundial for telling time out in the wild. You just lay your cheek against this stock, sight over my own special design, cloverleaf sight, and you just can't miss. Tell Dad it's great for target shooting. 
and varmint, and, varmint. and it will make, it will a, make swell, a swell, a swell, a swell Christmas, Christmas gift. gift. Wow. The next issue arrived, and Red Rider was even more insistent, now implying that the supply of Red Rider BB guns was limited, and to order now, and see if your dealer gets them in before it's too late. It was the second ad that actually did the trick on me. It was late November, and the Christmas fever was well upon me. I thought about a Red Rider air rifle in all of my waking hours, seven days a week, in school and out. I drew pictures of it in my reader, in my arithmetic book, on my hand in indelible ink, on Helen Weather's dress in front of me, in crayon. For the first time in my life, the initial symptoms of genuine lunacy, of mania, had set in. I imagined innumerable situations calling for the instant and the irrevocable need for a BB gun. Great fantasies where I fended off creeping marauders burrowing through the snow toward the kitchen, where only I and I alone stood between our tiny huddled family and insensate evil. Masked bandits attacked my father to be mowed down by my trusted cloverleaf sighted deadly weapon. I seriously mulled over the possibility of an invasion of raccoons, of which there were several in the county. Acts of selfless chivalry defending Esther Jane Alberry from escaped circus tigers. Time and time again, I saw myself a miraculous crack shot, picking off sparrows on the wing to the gasps of admiring girls and envious rivals on Cleveland Street. There was one dream that involved my entire class getting lost on a field trip to the swamps, wherein I led the tired, hungry band back to civilization using only my Red Rider compass and sundial. There was no question about it. Not only should I have such a gun, it was an absolute necessity. Early December saw the first of the great blizzards of that year. The wind howling down out of the Canadian wilds a few hundred miles to the north had screamed over frozen Lake Michigan and hit Holman, laying on the town great drifts of snow and long, story-high icicles and sub-zero temperatures where the air cracked and sang. Newspaper our streetcar wires creaked on caked ice, and kids plodded to school through 45-mile-an-hour gales, tilting forward like tiny furred radiator ornaments, moving stiffly over the barren, clattering ground. Preparing to go to school was about like getting ready for extended deep-sea diving. Long johns, corduroy knickers, checkered flannel lumberjack shirt, four sweaters, fleece-lined leatherette sheepskin coat, Helmet, goggles, mittens with leatherette gauntlets, and a large star with an Indian cheese face in the middle, three pair of socks, high tops, overshoes, and a 16-foot scarf wound spirally from left to right until only the faint glint of two eyes peering out of a mound of moving clothing told, told you that there was a kid in the neighborhood. There was no question of staying home. It never entered anyone's mind. It was a hardier time, of course. And Miss Bodkin was a hardier teacher than the present breed. Cold was something that was accepted, like air, clouds, and parents, a fact of nature, and as such could not be used in any fraudulent scheme to stay out of school. My mother would simply throw her shoulder against the front door, pushing back the advancing drifts and stone ice, the wind raking the living room rug with an angry fury for an instant, and we would be launched one after the other, my brother and I like astronauts, into the unfriendly Arctic space. The door clanged shut behind us, and that was it. It was make school or die. Scattered over the icy wastes around us could be seen other tiny, beferred jots of wind-driven humanity, all painfully toiling towards the Warren G. Harding School, miles away over the tundra, waddling under the weight of frost-covered clothing like tiny frozen bowling balls with feet, an occasional piteous whimper could be heard faintly, but lost instantly in the sigh of the eternal wind. All of us were bound for geography lessons involving the exports of Peru, reading lessons dealing with fat cats and dogs named Jack. But over it all, like a faint, thin, off-stage chorus, was the building excitement. Christmas was on its way. Each day was more exciting than the last because Christmas was one day closer lovely, beautiful, glorious Christmas around which the entire year revolved, at least the kid year. Off on the far horizon, beyond the railroad yards and the great refinery tanks, lay our own private mountain range, dark and mysterious, cold and uninhabited, 
outlined against the steel-gray skies of Indiana winter, the steel mills. They lay on the horizon like a mysterious black mountain range. Downtown Holman, in Indiana, was prepared for its yearly bacchanalia of peace on earth and goodwill to men. Across Holman Avenue and State Street, the gloomy main thoroughfares drifted with snow that had lain for months and would remain until well into spring. Ice encrusted, frozen drifts along the curbs were strung strands of green and red Christmas bulbs and banners that snapped and cracked in the gale. From the streetlights hung plastic ivy wreaths surrounding three-dimensional Santa Claus faces. For several years, the windows of Goldblatt's department store had been curtained and dark. Their corner window was traditionally a major high-water mark of the pre-Christmas season. It set the tone, the motif, of their giant Yuletide Jubilee. Kids were brought in from miles around just to see the window. Old codgers would recall vintage years when the window had flowered more fulsomely than in ordinary times, and this was one of those years. The magnificent display was officially unveiled on a crowded Saturday night. It was an instant smash hit. First-nighters packed earmuff to earmuff, their steamy breath clouding up the sparkling plate glass, jostled in rapt admiration before a golden, tinkling panoply of, me of mechanicized electronic joy. It was the heyday of the Seven Dwarfs and their virginal den mother, Snow White. Walt Disney's seven cutie pies hammered and sawed, chiseled and painted, while Santa, bouncing Snow White on his mechanical knee, ho-ho-hoed through eight strategically placed loudspeakers, interspersed by choruses of hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. Grumpy sat at the controls of a miniature eight-wheel Rock Island Road steam engine, and, and Sleepy played a marimba, while in the background... Inexplicably, Mrs. Klaus ceaselessly ironed a red shirt. Sparkling artificial snow drifted down on Shirley Temple dolls. Flexible flyers and tinker toy sets glowed in the golden spotlight. In the foreground, a frontier stockade made of Lincoln logs was manned by a company of kilted lead highlanders who were doubtfully fending off an attack by six U.S. Army medium tanks. It was an incredible display. By the way, history has always been vague in Indiana. A few, a few feet away stood an Arthurian cardboard castle with Raggedy Andy sitting on the drawbridge, his feet in the moat through which a Lionel freight train burping real smoke went round and round. Dopey sat in Amos and Andy's pedal-operated fresh air taxi cab beside a stuffed panda holding a lollipop in his paw bearing the heart-tugging legend, Hug Me. From fluffy cotton clouds above, the own quintuplet dolls wearing plaid golf knickers hung from billowing parachutes, having just bailed out of a high-flying balsa wood Foker triplane. All in all, Santa's workshop made Salvador Dali look like Norman Rockwell. It was a good year. I'll be back in about two or three minutes here on WOR New York after we have a few brief breaks for a couple of spots on Christmas Eve. Someday you'll own, someday you'll own, sooner or later you'll own generals. Yeah, sooner or later you'll own generals, buddy. So, uh... On this Christmas Eve, we'll remind you that you go in snow or we pay to tow. That's guaranteed traction, and that's what you'll get from good old friendly General Tire. They got General's famous glass belt gripper 780, priced at just two for $54. And that's for popular size A7813, tubeless black wall. Very popular. It's way up on the hit parade. So check your yellow pages for the General Tire headquarters nearest you. Sooner or later, your own General's. Yeah, and let's see, uh, here's a little quick reminder from Dell Paperbacks. They say that they have a book called In the Onion Field by one Joseph Wambaugh, a real-life suspense bestseller available now as a Dell paperback. And uh, not only that, they have uh, another Dell book that you may find interesting. The greatest bestsellers. Books like Rebecca, Exodus, Hawaii. You don't just read them, you live them. 
Beulah Land by Lonnie Coleman is that kind of book. A sensational bestseller compared by many to Gone with the Wind. But Beulah Land is so frank it could only be published in our time. Beulah Land, the story of a great plantation and all its outward splendor and secret shame. Beulah Land, a Dell paperback bestseller. People at the Barnes & Noble bookstore would like to remind you that books make wonderful Christmas gifts. Hey, Phyllis, here's a book on sailing for your Uncle Ted. No, sailing was last year. Now he's into homemade wine and antique furniture. Oh, well, do we get him this wine book or one on antiques? Uh, why don't we get him both? How come you're so smart? <laughs> at Barnes & Noble, we've got a whole world of books to choose from. Especially books for people who like to do things. For instance, we've got books for people who like to garden, books for cooks, books for backpackers, and just about anything else you can think of. In fact, we've got more books on how to do more things than any other bookstore in the world. And they all make thoughtful, enduring gifts for Christmas or any other occasion. So this year, bring your Christmas list to the Barnes & Noble Bookstore at 5th Avenue and 18th Street in Manhattan. And don't forget to put your own name on the list. After all, don't you deserve a book from Barnes & Noble, too, this Christmas? The smell of the disinfectant just about overpowers the evergreen in the patient's lounge. But the tree, hung with paper chains and stars, looks bravely festive anyway. To the children in this hospital, this tree is Christmas. To many, it's the most Christmas they've ever had. There are thousands of kids like this, poor, sick, handicapped, and retarded, in hospitals and institutions throughout the WOR area. Your gift to the WOR Children's Christmas Fund puts presents under the tree. Share Christmas. Send your check or money order to the WOR Children's Christmas Fund, Box 710, Times Square Station, New York 10036. Okay, let's get on with the story here. We're, uh, we're reading a uh, chapter out of uh, In God We Trust, All Others Pay Cash. In fact, it's the first chapter, and uh, the title of this chapter, of this, of this work, uh, which was published, by the way, in 1961 by Doubleday, and is available still in paperback, uh, the, the paperback company in this case being Dolphin, if you're curious about picking up a copy. It's called In God We Trust. All others pay cash, and it's Dolphin, number C486. And now I go on with the story. Uh, this is uh, the first chapter. Of course, it's, uh, I must also add quickly, if you're following it, some people follow it, by the way, as I read. Uh, it's been uh, edited for air because it's far too long to read in the short time we have. However, there's the Christmas window, Goldblatt's. This is fiction, by the way, for those of you who are curious. Uh, there are no people of this type really around, but it is a fiction story and originally appeared in Playboy. It was a good year, maybe a great one. Like a swelling Christmas balloon, the excitement mounted until the whole town tossed restlessly in bed and made plans for the big day. Already my own scheme was well underway. My personal dream, casually, carefully, calculatingly, I had booby-trapped the house with copies of Open Road for Boys, all open to Red Rider's slit-eyed face. My father, a great John Reader, found himself for the first time in his life in alien literary waters. My mother, grabbing for her copy of Screen Romances, found herself cleverly euchred into reading a Red Rider sales pitch. I had stuck a copy of Open Road for Boys inside the cover, showing Clark Gable clasping Loretta Young to his heaving breast. At breakfast, I hinted that there was a rumor of loose bears in the neighborhood. I was ready to deal with them, if I had the proper equipment, of course. At first, my mother and the old man did not rise to the bait, and I began to grow anxious, and, of course, inevitably, overplayed my hand. Christmas was only two weeks away. I couldn't waste time with subtlety or droll innuendo. My brother, occasionally emerging from under the daybed during this critical period, was already well involved in some private little brother persiflage of his own, involving an erector set with motor, capable of constructing drawbridges, Eiffel Towers, Ferris wheels, and operating guillotines. I knew that if he got wind of my scheme, all was lost. He would then begin wheedling and whining for what I wanted, which would result in nobody scoring, since he was obviously too young for deadly weapons. 
So I cleverly pretended that what I wanted, nothing more, was just a simple, utilitarian, unpretentious Sandy Andy, a highly symbolic educational toy popular at the time, consisting of a kind of funnel under which was mounted a tiny conveyor belt of little scoop-like gondolas that came with a bag of white sand that was poured into the funnel. The sand tripling out of the bottom into the gondola set the belt in motion. As each gondola was filled, it moved back down the track to be replaced by another, which, when filled, moved down another notch, and endlessly they went, dumping sand out at the bottom of the track and starting up the back loop to be refilled again, on and on, until all the sand was deposited in the red cup at the bottom of the track. The kid then emptied the cup into the funnel and started over again, ceaselessly, senselessly, round and round. How like life itself! It was the perfect toy to teach a kid what it's all about. Through my brain, however, there dashed and danced visions of six guns snapped from the hip and shattering bottles, an annoying, nameless frenzy of impending ecstasy. Well, I had to do something about it. And so one day, my mother, leaning over a pot of simmering oatmeal, suddenly asked out of the blue, What would you like for Christmas? Horrified, I heard myself blurt, A Red Rider BB gun! Without pausing or even missing a stroke with her tablespoon, she shot back, Oh no, you'll shoot out your eyes. It was a classic mother BB gun block. I was sunk. That deadly phrase, used many times before by hundreds of mothers, was not surmountable by any means known to kid them. I had really booted it. Such was my mania, my desire for a Red Rider carbine, that I immediately began to rebuild the dike. Uh, I was just kidding. Uh, even though Flick is getting one, you know. Ha <laughs> ha, Flick's getting one. <laughs> that was a lie, of course. I guess, uh, well, uh, what I'd like is a Sandy Andy, I guess. <laughs> I watched the back of her Chinese red chenille bathrobe anxiously, waiting for any sign that my shaft had struck home. They're dangerous. I don't want anybody shooting their eyes out. The boom was lowered, and I was under it. With leaden heart and frozen feet, I waddled to school. At recess time, little banks of kids huddled together for warmth amid the craggy gray snowbanks and the howling gale. The telephone wires overhead whistled like banshees, while the trapeze rings and the swings clanked hollowly as Schwartz and Flick and Bruner and I discussed the most important thing, next to what I'm going to get for Christmas, which was what I'm getting my mother and father for Christmas. We talked in hushed, hoarse whispers to guard against security leaks. Schwartz, his eyes darting like a foreign agent, leaned over and said, I'm getting my father a new flip gun. Sheer creative brilliance, a flip gun. That's for spraying mosquitoes. What a fantastic creative idea. I'm getting my old man a rose that squirts water, said Flick. So we talked back and forth. I wouldn't even discuss what I was going to get. Not a way. And so time went on. And more and more it began to look like I was not going to get my BB gun. And so finally... At the far end of Toyland in Goldblatt's, which was on the third floor, is a Santa Claus, a big Santa Claus, sitting there on his throne, asking kids what they wanted for Christmas. I figured I'd try it. On a snowy throne, framed with red and white candy canes under a suspended squadron of plastic angels, blowing silver trumpets in a glowing golden grotto, sat the man, the connection, Santa Claus himself. In northern Indiana, Santa Claus is a big man, both spiritually and physically, and the Santa Claus at Goldblatt's was officially recognized among kids as being unquestionably the Santa Claus in person. Eight feet tall, shiny, high, black patent leather boots, a nimbus cloud of snow-white beard, and a real thrumming, belt-creaking stomach, no pillows or stuffing, I mean a real stomach. A long line of nervous, fidgeting, greedy urchins wound in and out of the aisles, shoving, sniffling, and above all, waiting, waiting to tell him what they wanted. In those days, it wasn't, it was not easy to disbelieve fully in Santa Claus, because there wasn't much else to believe in. There were many theological arguments over the nature of the existence of the affirmation and denial of his, of his existence. However, ten days before zero hour, the air pulsing to the strains of we three kings of Orient are 
the store windows garlanded with green and red wreaths and the, store, and the toy department bristling with sleds, there were few who dared to disbelieve. As each day crept on to the next like some glacier, an arthritic glacier, the atheists among us grew moodier and less and less sure of ourselves until finally in each scoffing heart was the floating, drifting, nagging suspicion. Well, you never can tell. It did not pay to take chances, and so we waited in line for our turn. Behind me, a skinny seven-year-old girl wearing a brown stocking cap and gold-rimmed glasses hit her little brother steadily to keep him in line. She had green teeth. He was wearing an aviator's helmet with the goggles pulled down over his eyes. His galoshes were open, and his maroon corduroy knickers were damp. Behind them, a fat boy in a huge sheepskin coat stood numbly, his eyes watering in vague fear his nose red and running. Ahead of my brother and me, a long, uneven procession of stocking caps, mufflers, mittens, and earmuffs are inched painfully forward, while in the hazy distance, in his magic glowing cave, Mr. Klaus sat, each in turn on his broad red knee, and whispered to exultant dream after exultant dream. Closer and closer we crept. My mother and father had stashed us in line and disappeared. We were alone. Nothing stood between us and our confessor, our benefactor, our dispenser of BB guns, and 297 other beseechers at the throne. Over the serpentine line roared a great sea of sound, tinkling bells, recorded carols, the hum and clatter of electric trains, and a record that over and over and over and over again played jingle bells over and over and over. We stood in line. And Santa Claus got closer and closer, his great red form twinkling in the golden light. One moment, my brother and I were safely back in the tricycle and Irish mail department, and the next instant, we stood at the, at the foot of Mount Olympus itself. Santa's enormous, gleaming white snowdrift of a throne soared 10 or 15 feet above our heads in a mountain of red and green tinsel carpeted in flashing Christmas tree bulbs and gleaming ornaments. Each kid in turn was proud of a tiny staircase at the side of the mountain on Santa's left. And as he passed, his last customer onto his right and down a red chute, back into oblivion for another year. And over it all, the music was deafening. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Jingle bells, jingle all the way. Sung by an echo-chambered echo chorus that kept going on and on. High above me in the sparkling gloom, I could see my brother's yellow and brown stocking cap. He's up there on Santa's knee. He squatted briefly. I heard a booming ho, 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 and then a high, thin, familiar trailing wail, one that I'd heard billions of times before, as my brother broke into his primal cry of fear. A claw dug into my elbow, and I was launched upward toward the mountaintop. My kid brother had disappeared. I had long before decided to level with Santa, to really lay it on the line. No Sandy Andy, no kid stuff. I was going to ride the range with Red Rider. Santa Claus was going to have to get the straight poop. And what's your name, little boy? What's your name, little boy? His booming baritone crashed out over the chipmunks that were singing. He reached down and neatly hooked my sheepskin collar, swooping me upward. And there I sat on the biggest knee in creation, looking down and out over the endless expanse of Toyland and down to the tiny figures. What's your name, little boy? What's your name? The record ended briefly, and it started up again. Over and over and over, they sang. Uh, uh, my head wouldn't work. I couldn't think. Uh, what? Uh, 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 was all I could say. Uh, uh, that's a fine name, little boy. That's a fine name. Ho, ho, ho. Santa's warm, moist breath poured down over me through some cosmic steam radiator. Santa smoked camels, it smelled, just like my Uncle Charles. Ho, ho, ho. My mind had gone blank. Frantic, I tried to remember what it was I wanted for Christmas. What I wanted. I was blowing it. I couldn't think. My head was gone. Santa kept going, ho, ho, ho. What would you like? Wouldn't you like a nice football, young man? Ho, ho. My mind groped. Football, football. Who the hell wants a football? All I could say was, yeah. My 
God, a football. My mind slammed into gear already. Santa was sliding me off my knee and towards the red shoot. I didn't want a football. And I could see behind me already another white-faced kid was bobbing upwards. I want a Red Rider BB gun with a special Red Rider sight and a compass and a stock and a sundial. I shouted, Ho, ho, ho! You'll shoot your eye out, kid! Ho, ho, ho! Merry Christmas! Down the chute I went. Down the chute I went. I've never been struck by a bolt of lightning, but I knew how it must feel. The back of my head was numb. My feet clanked leadenly beneath me. As I returned to earth at the bottom of the chute, another snow-white lady shoved the famous free gift that they were giving out into my mitten. I got my free gift. It was a barely recognizable plastic Kris Kringle stamped with bold red letters. Merry Christmas. Shop at Goldblatt's. Free parking. He spun me back out into Toyland. My kid brother stood under a counter piled high with raggedy and dolls. From nowhere, my mother and father appeared. Did you tell Santa what you wanted? The old man asked. Yeah. Did he ask you if you've been a good boy? No. Ah, don't worry, he knows. <laughs> I'll bet he knows about that basement window you busted. Don't worry, he knows. <laughs> Maybe that was it. My mind reeled with the realization maybe Santa did know how rotten I'd been and that the football was only a threat. It was not only a threat, it was a punishment. There had been for generations on Cleveland Street a theory that if you were not a good boy, quote, you would reap your just desserts under the Christmas tree. Maybe I was good business. Oh, God, no, no BB gun. A damn football. The next few days groaned by. Day after day it went past. And then we were going to have our school party. Everybody was to bring paper wreaths, and Crayola Santa Claus were drawn. In the corner of our room, atop a desk decorated with crepe paper rosettes, sat our Christmas grab bag. Every kid in the class had bought a gift for the grab bag. I had bought for Helen Weathers a large, amazingly lifelike, jet-black rubber tarantula. <laughs> I cackled fiendishly as I wrapped it. And even now, its beady green eyes glared from somewhere in the depths of the Christmas grab bag. I knew she'd like it. It would be great. Miss Bodkin, after recess, then said to all the kids, Now I want all of you, boys and girls, to write a theme. A theme, a rotten theme before Christmas. What is this, a theme before Christmas? I want you to write a theme entitled, What I Want for Christmas. Aha! The clouds lifted. I saw a faint gleam of light at the other end of the black cave of gloom. Ever since my visit to Santa... Yes, I could write what I wanted in a theme. I remember to this day how I wrote it. It's cagey, winged phrases and glorious imagery. Quote, what I want for Christmas is a Red Rider BB gun with a compass in the stock and this thing that tells time. I think everybody should have a Red Rider BB gun. They are very good at Christmas. I don't think a football is a very good Christmas present. I wrote it on blue-lined paper from my tablet and handed it in. It had to have good margins. Miss Bodkin was very tough on uneven margins. And I waited. The final days before vacation dawned dank and misty with swirling eddies of ice wind that rattled the porch swing. Warren G. Harding School glowed like a jeweled oasis among the sooty snowbanks. Lights blazed from all the windows, and in every room the Christmas party spirit had kids writhing in their seats. The morning winged by, and after lunch Miss Bodkin announced that the rest of the afternoon would be party time. She handed out our graded themes, folded with our names, scrawled on the outside. A big red B in Miss Bodkin's direct hand glowed on my literary effort. I opened it, expecting Miss Bodkin's usual penciled corrections, which ran along the lines of, Watch your margins or check spelling. But this time, a personal note leaped right out of my team. It flew around the room and fastened itself leech-like on the back of my neck. You'll shoot your eye out. Merry Christmas. Good God. I sat in my seat, shipping water from every seam. Was there no end to this conspiracy of irrational prejudice against Red Rider and his peacemaker? Nervously, I pulled out of my desk the door to hear back copy of Open Road for Boys, which I'd carried with me everywhere, waking and sleeping for the past few weeks. 
Red Rider's handsome orange face with the big balloon coming out of his mouth did not look discouraged or defeated. Red must have been a kid once himself, and they must have told him the same thing when he asked for his first Colt 44 for Christmas. I stuffed my tattered dreams back into my geography book. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? The glee club filed in and sang, Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. It was party. Who cared about party? That already been squashed. You'll shoot your eyes out, kid. Even from Miss Botkin. Mechanically, my jaws crunched on the concrete hard rock candy, and I stared hopelessly out of the window, past cut-out Santas and garland red and green chains. It was getting dark. It was all over. It was Christmas Eve the next day. And all day long, we wrapped presents, but it was not Christmas for me, for I knew, I knew it was all over. All over. And we wrapped and wrapped and wrapped. Early the next morning, I woke up. It was a gray, grim morning. It was barely light. In fact, it was just after six in the morning. I had no real hope. A football, maybe. Maybe a rubber dagger. Maybe a lead zeppelin wound up and ran around on the floor. Who wants that junk? Who cared about fire trucks, Lincoln logs, erector sets? But who knows? I was the first up. Bright, bright morning. Sun gleaming down. I came tearing down waited for the for the packages and there they were under the tree who knows during the night a great snow had fallen covering the gritty remains of past snowfalls and I was alone my kid brother was still asleep my mother and father were asleep in the bedroom I looked at the packages and there under the tree was a long thin flat package Marked with my name, and it said, From Santa. I ripped it open. My God, it was a BB gun. A Red Rider BB gun! There was a pack of BBs with it. And a rolled up tube of targets at five o'clock in the morning. I put on my bathrobe. I pulled on my corduroy knickers, my goloshes. And I eased myself out into the cold, feeding the gun in my hand. I had a Red Rider BB gun. The temperature was maybe 20 below zero. I trudged down the steps, barely discernible in the soft fluff. And now I stood in the clean air, ready to consummate my great, long, painful, ecstatic love affair. I had got my BB gun. Santa Claus had come through. Brushing the snow off the third step, I propped up a gleaming Red Rider target, the black rings and blue bullseye standing out starkly against the snowy whiteness. Above the bullseye, Red Rider watched me, his eyes following my every move. I backed off into the snow a good twenty feet, slammed the stock down onto my left kneecap, holding the barrel with my mittened left hand, flipped the mitten off my right hand, and hooking my fingers in the icy carbine lever, cocked my blue steel buddy for the first time. I heard the BB click into the chamber, the spring inside twang sharply, and with a clunk she rested, taut, hard, and loaded, in my chapped, bluing hands. For the first time I sighted down over that cold barrel, the heart-shaped Rear sight almost brushing my nose and the blade of the front sight wavering back and forth, up and down, and finally coming to rest sharply, cutting the heart and laying dead on the innermost ring. Red Rider didn't move a muscle, his Stetson flaring out above the target as he waited. Slowly I squeezed the frosty trigger back, back, back. For one instant I thought, what? It doesn't work. The BB gun doesn't work. We'll have to send it back. And then... Crack! The gun jerked upward, and for a brief instant, everything stood still. The target twitched, a tiny tick, and then a massive wallop. A gigantic, slashing impact crashed across the left side of my face. My horn-rimmed glasses spun away from my head into the snowbank. 
For several seconds, I stood stunned, not knowing what had happened. Warm blood trailing down over my cheek and onto the walnut stock of my Red Rider 200-shot range model BB gun. My God, I was shot in the eye! I lowered the barrel convulsively. The target still stood. Red Rider was unscratched. A ragged, uncontrolled tidal wave of pain throbbing and singing rocked my head. The ricocheting BB had missed my eye by maybe a quarter of an inch, and a long, angry, bloody welt extended from my cheekbone almost to my ear. It was divine retribution. Red Rider had struck again. Another bad guy gunned down. It was me. Frantically, I scrambled for my glasses, and then the most catastrophic blow of all, they were pulverized. My glasses were broken. I put the horn rims over on my nose. The front door creaked open. Just then, my mother looked out of the door and said, Now be careful. Don't shoot. Don't shoot your eye. Now be careful of your new BB gun. She hadn't seen yet. My eye was almost shot out. Oh, my God. And then she saw my broken glasses. She says, How did you break your glasses? I said, an icicle fell off the roof. It bounced off the gun, and it bounced up and hit me. I began to cry, faking it at first. But then the shock and the fear took over. It was the real thing. She says, now, there, you're all right. It's just a little bump. You're lucky you didn't cut your eye. Those icicles can kill people, you know. You're really lucky. Hold this rag on it and don't wake your brother. I had faked it. I had pulled it off. I had pulled it off. I had convinced Mother that the icicle had broken my glasses. But I knew I had shot my eye out. I learned something that day. Maybe they know something. They were right. And there I sat in the horn and hard art and sipped my coffee. Yes. I wondered whether Red Rider was still dispensing retribution and frontier justice of old. Considering the number of kids I see with broken glasses, I suspect he is. Kids, you'll shoot your eye out. And that is the classic story from In God We Trust. All others pay cash that we read every winter at the same time, every Christmas Eve. It's entitled Duel in the Snow. A red rider nails the Cleveland Street kid. My God, there's something they know. Be careful. Have a good Christmas. I hope it worked out well. And watch your driving, Dad. Maybe they're right when they say don't drink and drive at the same time, in spite of the fact that you drive better after you've drunk. Right, kid? Uh -huh. Shoot your eye out. Look out.